Okay, guys. Uh, so first off, I'd like to thank all the uh, sponsors and uh, the volunteers, you know, who set up this thing. Uh, it's been a great conference, so thank you, and I appreciate everyone that's attended as well. Um, so I've managed infrastructure and security personnel for about 15 years, and uh, I've learned a lot of things along the way. And what, what I'm going to present is uh, some of those key learnings, and I hope that you get some stuff out of it. This should be an interactive session, so feel free to just uh, blurt out anything that you want at any time. It's not a big deal. It should be encouraged. It won't sidetrack anything. So we got a full hour here. To start out with, you know, we're here to develop our skills, mostly technical, and most security conferences focus on the technical. I applaud B-sides, you know, for taking on this presentation, which is a, a, a lot less technical and a little bit more career-centric. I think that's something that's missing right now. As an example of the amount of attention and money we spend on conferences, this is a typical conference that's going on later this year in Orlando. It's about $5,000 for a class, and then you've got $2,600 for the flight, the hotel. It, it's a lot of money. And it's, it's worth every penny, you know, this is something we're kind of used to and it's good quality training. But if we're willing to spend that much money on a conference, you know, we should be willing to invest a little bit of time in our career as well to, to supplement that. We're going to go and talk through a couple of ideas for you to look at. Has anybody spent $7,000 uh, travel and expenses? course included before? Yeah. More than 7,000? 8,000? 9,000? Okay, so 8,000? Wow. What was the conference? ISACA conference. Okay, note to self. Online training for ISACA. <laughs> All right. Well, it's pretty expensive, and we spent a lot of money, like I said, on security conferences, um, and we need that. But are we also developing ourselves and our careers? You know, uh, technologies are constantly advancing, and we need to learn those skills. We need to stay current. But these technologies come and go. And if you strip away all those technologies that are coming and going, you know, we're still there. And we need to be able to develop ourselves so that we're in it for the long haul. So what I'm saying is, Remember to develop yourself, not just your technical skills. You know, try to, try to think about when the last time was that you maybe sat down for an hour, even on a picnic table, you know, just kind of sketching out your career path, like, you know, what an inventory of your strengths, you know, where you're going with things. And, you know, if it's been more than a year, then, then this is definitely something you're going to want to focus on. Because, you know, you're the one constant in all of this, you know, as the technologies come and go. So, uh, you know, those technical skills are just one piece of a very big pie. So, to provoke you a little bit, I've got a couple of questions for you. Who here is completely satisfied with their current employer? Okay, the guy in the back sitting next to his boss. Okay, brown noser. Okay. All right. But, uh, you know, the truth is, you know, there's things that are s satisfying about our jobs, and there's also some things that aren't as satisfying, and that's normal. But our goal should be to have a greater percentage of the things that get us jazzed every day and excited about our career, the contributions we're going to make in the industry and such. So, other questions. Are you compensated based on the value you deliver, or are you just coming in punching the clock every day and... You know, you could do a great job, maybe invent some uh, really innovative technology and not really get uh, any recognition or additional pay for it. Is what you do on a daily basis, is it making a difference in the world? Are you feeling like it's making a difference, you're making a difference? And are you working on your life's work? And do you aspire for a more meaningful role? So those are just some provocative questions. Any questions to reflect back to me right now? Yeah.
No, that's okay. I mean, I, <laughs> I, let me, let me uh, summarize the question and make sure that it's the right one. But you, what, I think what you're saying is your job is just a, a sliver, maybe a large one, but still it's just a sliver of who you are as a person and where you're going long term. You've got some goals that are bigger than just a job or a paycheck, right? Would you mind sharing what that is? Okay. Right on. Yep. Yeah, that's a very good point. I think it's it's different for everyone. I can tell you the way I deal with the struggle is if I feel like I'm fighting upstream all the time and I'm kind of stressed out, then I know I'm I'm uh, over allocating myself towards the job. You know, when it becomes stressful instead of passionate, then I know I've gone too far, and maybe it's time to take a break and reevaluate things, you know, take a break, take a weekend, but uh, let's, let's continue on and let's see if some of the bullets uh, address your concern. I'm thinking in a couple of slides there may be something that's helpful, but uh, I appreciate the question. So the whole point of this talk is really empowering you and kind of getting in that mindset that, you know, you can take charge of your own information security career. There's some things that you might be able to influence, but there's a lot of things that you can completely take ownership of, and, uh, and that's the majority of this topic. So if you're not jazzed about what you do every day, it's, it's definitely time for a change. That doesn't mean you need to go out and quit, but there's something that needs to change, and it could be your attitude, it could be that uh, what you enjoy doing, you're not doing as much of right now, and you need to talk to your boss about a role change or propose a new role altogether, that sort of thing. But life is short, and we need to make the most of it and do what we love doing with the people we love doing it with, you know, like this security community. So that should be part of our goals. And living our purpose and focusing on delivering that life, life's work, that's what your career should be about. And if you can get an alignment between what you want to do in your life and what you're doing in your career, um, it, it's a really good feeling, and I think that gives one purpose and a feeling of confidence that they're on the right path. You are the main ingredient to your success, so it's important that you take charge of that career. Okay, so I've got two mindsets to compare here. One of them is what I call the victimhood mentality, which is obviously negative, negative Nancy kind of stuff. And the other is the take charge mentality. So just to compare the, the two here, with the take charge mentality, you have a vision to fulfill with your career. And so your career is kind of a, a building block in your path. And so you're picking your employers based on how to further your life's work. The victimhood mentality side of things would be, you know, feeling like they have a vision for you and they are using up your career and perhaps wasting your time. On the take charge side, you're maximizing your impact in the world through your career. On the victimhood side, you feel like you're not good enough to make an impact. How could you possibly make an impact? You know, that sort of thinking. On the take charge side, you have a deliberate effort to align your work with your career goals. And it's a constant work, kind of like trimming sails if you're sailing. On the victimhood side, you're doing what people tell you to do and just going through the motions and you just end up wherever they throw you, wherever they need you. And the last one on the, on the take charge side, recognize when it's time to move on so that you can continue your growth. On the victimhood side, you're stagnating at your current job 
you're just paralyzed by your fear of, well, what if I left? You know, am I going to get another job? And uh, some things that's not on the slide, I really think that the on the victimhood point, I think we've all been here, I know that I have, but you're waiting for a promotion, and maybe you're waiting for that performance review cycle, you're waiting for a promotion, you're waiting for a raise, you're waiting for someone to tell you that you did a good job, and um, you know maybe the, the corporation is offering some accoutrements for you to stay with them from a retention standpoint, even though you're not really liking what you're doing. I consider that all victimhood. And um, so the goal is to obviously be more on the take charge mentality side of it. Any questions on that? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so how do you balance the uh, the mantra of, you know, if you're not enjoying what you're doing, making a change and moving on versus, you know, there could be a danger of moving on constantly and, you know, not being able to hold a job. I think that there's a whole lot that goes into making the change. So, you know, you have to validate some assumptions. When you set about making a change, you need to make sure that first of all, the change would really be in alignment with your career. And that means asking a potential employer and some of the employees some really tough questions that you feel uncomfortable doing, that you might feel like is gonna blow it on the interview, but you really have to make sure that it's a good fit. And um, you know, Josh Moore was on the podcast recently and he wrote uh, something about, you know, if you, share certain things with an employer, they may not call you in for an interview, such as, you know, your race or, you know, gender, things of this nature, which, you know, your true nature, who you are. And I really thought it was powerful when he said that if they don't like you for who you are, then you shouldn't work there anyway, right? Because it's just not going to be a good fit. For whatever reason it is, whether it's legal or not, um, so I think a lot of a lot of the ways to prevent thrashing when you're looking for new jobs all the time is to make sure it's a very deliberate move and you might have to sleep on it. I also like it when I see people talking to other people about the change and you know mentorship and find out, you know, bounce some ideas off them, see what they think and just get some independent views, tap into that mastermind concept. Good question. So what I've got here are five tips over the next few slides for owning your InfoSec career. And it's visualize your success, create a plan, build your brand, build your network, and take action. Action being a pretty important part of it. On the first one, to visualize your success, I've created this model here that I just kind of think about. And I call it the PADS model. And it's a purpose, which is the most important part. Uh, having a definitive purpose, you know what you're passionate about, um, what makes you unique, that sort of thing. And having a great attitude. And um, it's important to really focus on the attitude, I think, in our space, because a lot of what we do uh, is some of the darker side. Does anyone here uh, focus on the darker side of InfoSec where you know, you're reading something that you just can't believe someone is doing. Yeah? Um, that kind of takes a toll on your attitude, and you got to get refreshed. you got to refill your, your attitudinal pot. Discipline is pretty important, too, because some of the things that's important to your career requires a certain cadence, you know, like keeping up relations with uh, various... Uh, friends, former co-workers, that sort of thing. That requires discipline. It won't just happen on its own. Left to your own accord, it, you probably wouldn't do those things. Discipline would be putting a calendar invite for yourself to sit down for one hour, once a quarter, to look at your career plan, figure out if the goals are still the same, and where you are relative to those goals, and if you want to make some shifts at all. 
and of course skills. It's I saved it for last for a reason. You know, I, I don't think we need to dwell on the skills too much, but I will say that it's more than just the technical. It's also the leadership skills in building the next generation of security professionals that will come after us. So one of the things with this little triangle here, the PADS model, is that I'm advocating that if you're only focused on any one area of that triangle, you're not going to get it done. And if you do get something done, it's not going to be complete. Um, to, to really have a rich career, you're going to have to focus on all of them. Have you ever known someone that had great skills but had a bad attitude? You know, that's kind of career limiting. I think we've all known people like that. And what about someone who has great discipline skills but they have no definitive purpose? You know, this from a profile perspective, might be someone that's new to InfoSec and uh, you know they can be counted on, but they, they're just kind of wondering. They don't know where they're going yet. So, you know, the point is embrace, embrace all the challenges that come up uh, with your attitude, purpose, skills, discipline, anything that makes you uncomfortable in any of these areas really focus on it and try to do it because that uncomfortable feeling is you growing. So make the most of wherever you are as well. So your job, if you're not enjoying some aspects of your job, make the most of what you can with it. And um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit later about some things that you can do to have those conversations with your boss, etc., cetera, to, to make that a better role. But just try to maximize all the experiences that come your way. So this slide here is an interesting one. The, um, the plan consists of defining what your mission is, what your goals are, identifying the gaps that you have in yourself right now and your experience, maybe your resume, and developing an action plan to fill those gaps, and then taking action and continually reassessing where you are relative to that plan. So on the goals piece, we're talking about short-term and long-term goals. And when you're identifying gaps, think of it in terms of, uh, could be training gaps, technical skills, interpersonal skills, uh, maybe it's presenting, that sort of thing. And on your action plan, I like to think in terms of one year, two year, three year, five, 10, 20, and you know, that's why you have this cone, this career cone here, which I'm going to go over in just a second. The, um, the continual assessment part, I think, is the most important piece because this is what determines how fast you're going to advance in your career. So the more frequently you assess where you are relative to your plan and start tweaking certain things, if they need to be tweaked, the more confident you're going to be that you're headed the right direction because you will be. You'll be making changes ever so slightly along the way. It's important that when you try certain things and it doesn't work out, that you get back up and try it again. If it's the right thing, but maybe you do it a different way. But the point is, you don't give up. You keep persevering and making tweaks to the way that you proceed. And that's all part of the continual assessment and feedback of lessons learned. So with the, with the cone there, this is just an example. It doesn't uh, work this way for everyone in security, but imagine on the far left side of the cone, you're starting out as a noob, just getting into security, and you're going to progress through that cone all the way to CISO. And I'm not advocating that everyone should be a CISO either. This is just an example, though. If you were to lay out a career plan in a fashion similar to this and have a few uh, uh, steps in between, I think that it will inspire you to come up with actions that you should be taking along that road. And those actions along the top are experiences, connections, you know, making connections with people in the community. It could be connections in the business. And knowledge, skills, abilities, accomplishments that would be expected of you projects, publications, and presentations that you might deliver. These are things that 
I would say as a noob, as an analyst, if you knew that you were going to be a CISO, I think it would be a good idea, even way back there, to have a bullet that you're going to be bragging about when you go to interview as a CISO. So we're talking about maybe there is a magazine article on uh, managing a security team, you know, that, that you write possibly five years before. But when you apply for that CISO position, that step has been taken. So I think that you should be taking these steps with that vision in mind several years down the road. You should be taking those steps all along. Also, I like the analogy of lock picking. Does anyone here enjoy lock sport at all? Yeah, me too. So if you think about this, you know, these are kind of uh, pins. These phases are kind of pins in a, in a lock, and you're kind of lock picking your career. And, um, you know, if you look at the wavy line, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a, a jiggling effort that you'll have to do with the continual assessment and adjustment along the way to, uh, you know, release all those pins and unlock your dreams. On the subject of building your brand, I think it's important, first of all, to say we've all got a brand whether we know it or not, and we just need to be conscious of it. And whatever that brand is that we want to project, it's ideal for it to be who we really are and be authentic because anything else just won't last. You know, there's only what makes you special is you are unique, you are special. So when you build your brand, it's good to kind of focus on your strengths and uh, your experiences, that sort of thing. But uh, you want to build your brand consciously, leverage that uniqueness. And some of the things that you can do to project your brand would come across in the tweets that you do, the presentations you might give, articles that you write, the value that you deliver to the community in your area. So with all of this, you should be developing a portfolio because all of these types of things are going to be crucial for you as you seek to advance in your career and get hired or get additional clients. On building your network, I think that one of the most important things we can do in our career is to make new connections and build relationships and you know cause those relationships to become deeper and deeper in trust over time. These are people that you'll be relying on. You may end up working with them, for them. Maybe they work for you down the road. But I think the relationships are everything. And the way to build those relationships is to think about it as you're building your network and taking a genuine interest in people that you meet and finding out what they're skilled at. Maybe they have skills that you don't, and it complements you. So you want to build your relationships with others. You could do that by helping them adding value to them, helping market their skills, provide introductions, and help others um, to be successful in expanding their networks. So it's important to nurture the relationships, as, as I mentioned earlier, and stay in constant contact with these individuals, even if they no longer work at the place that you were uh, working at with them. One of my favorite quotes is um, the sales guy, Zig Ziglar. It says, you can have everything in life you want if you'll just help enough other people get what they want. And I really believe in that philosophy because I think that, you know, in service to others, uh, a lot of times we find ourselves. And um, we also find that those other people help us in our time of need. The last tip, taking action. So it's not enough to know what to do and just leave it as an idea. You really have to take action. And so you want to unleash your gifts to the world and deliver your life's work, your art. And to do that, you have to constantly stay focused on taking action and knowing when good enough is good enough. You don't have to seek perfection. Um, you want to continuously produce. So 
take advantage of opportunities as long as you're living authentically and you're not a jerk. Uh, what's going to happen is people are going to know what you want to do. You should be sharing your career path with other people and they are going to want to help you. That's just the way the universe works. And so unless you're a real jerk, you know, these, these other people are going to be going out of the way looking for how can I help you? How can I help you in your career? And so you have to be ready for those opportunities. You have to be able to share with them where you're going so that they'll be able to line those up for you too. You should be doing the same for others. So constantly take, take steps forward along your career path and don't wait or beg permission from anyone to move forward in your life, in your career. It's your career. We're talking about taking charge of it. So, you know, just uh, stay on your career path. And sometimes that means you have to make a change. But if you have to make that change, then do it. I remember uh, I heard a story, and I'm sure you guys have heard this before, about this gold miner. And they were like one foot away from reaching the gold, you know, as they're digging, and they just quit. But, you know, a couple more strikes, kablam, you know, they would have had the gold. And so it's important to just never give up on yourself and your career and where you're wanting to go. If you're passionate about it, even if you're not getting the results just yet to the level you were expecting, because maybe you had unrealistic expectations, stay with it. A lot of these things can take multiple years to, to really get going. It just depends on how well you exercise some of those tips, such as the relationship building and connections. All right, so here I've got a call to action. And the call to action is to meet five people at this conference that you don't already know. And find a way to interact with them, get their contact information, find a way to help them. So it could be some sort of a referral, it could be that they're struggling with a piece of uh, Python, who knows what it could be, but we're all struggling with something. So you know, there's probably s some strength that you have that can help someone else. Has anyone here already met five people that they did not know before the conference? Okay, so several of you. That's one of the disadvantages of presenting on the second day. But what I'll say is, um, I'll give you two other choices. Meet another five people, or try to get an awkward hug with Jason Street. Is that fair? So, um, I really think that these types of conferences, especially B-Sides, just phenomenal. A lot of work goes into it, so I'm gonna recommend also that you find a way to volunteer, even if you're volunteering for next year right now. Uh, you can get with some of the volunteers of the conference and find out how you can contribute and help the conference next year. And it's a great way to network, right? Any questions on what we've discussed so far? <laughs> 